What really is at the heart of it is that we're very early in understanding microbiome science. And so I think the FDA, you know, their job is to make sure that people are safe. And so they have to decide, is it more safe to give people this cure that has this incredibly high success rate when fatality is on the other side? Or is it more safe to say, hey, let's keep learning more about this before we actually introduce it into clinical care? Let's pivot for a moment and actually talk about C. diff, because that's one of the most compelling arguments for an intervention in treating human disease by manipulating the gut bacteria. So tell folks what Clostridium difficile is as a bacteria, and you already alluded to this, but how does it go from being kind of uh, a benign slash benevolent um, participant in our coexistence with the universe to one that could kill us? So Clostridium difficile is a strain. It exists, and many of us have it in low levels in our gut microbiome, and we walk around perfectly healthy and, and fine with it. Um, when you take an antibiotic, that's essentially almost like a nuclear bomb to your microbiome. It kills everything in there. Um, but in some cases, it doesn't kill everything. And so there are these strains of Clostridium difficile that after you take an antibiotic, it's killed all the different strains off, but it didn't kill your Clostridium difficile strain. And the problem with killing off all the other strains is now all the competition is gone. So you imagine, you know, you have all these, this ecosystem of different microbes, and now you've just gotten rid of all of them. So now you have this strain that has no competition and it can start to propagate unchecked. And so it's when you start to have these really high levels of this strain, Clostridium difficile, in your microbiome, that's when it starts to make you really sick. And actually, ultimately, it's fatal. And so the way in which we treat infections is through more antibiotics. And so when you have this Clostridium difficile infection, um, which is a result of having taken an antibiotic, almost ironically, the cure also is another antibiotic. And really what you're trying to do is to get an antibiotic that can kill that strain uh, and get it back to its low levels until your microbiome can reconstitute itself through the food that you eat. Um, the kind of success rate of those antibiotics, you know, varies from person to person, but overall it's something like 70% successful. And remember, fatality is on the other side of this. I was so. <laughs> just about to say, make sure people understand what non-success means here. Yes, you know? yes. So uh, yeah, 70% success is not great when the 30% means that you're, you're going to die on the other side. So one of the concepts was really to kind of go in the reverse direction and say, okay, if the problem is that now there's no competition and this guy can propagate unchecked, what if we just load up the the person's gut with, uh, you know, all these different microbes, reestablish an ecosystem, and then that's the way to kind of temper this thing down. And that's called a fecal microbiome transplant, where you, it's exactly what it sounds like. You literally take feces from a person and transplant it into another person. That thing has like a 99% success rate. So When was this first done? Oh man, this was first done. I feel like this was at least in the 90s, maybe yeah. earlier. Well, it was definitely done as one-offs before people were doing real studies with it. And actually a ton of them were have been done in Australia. It's like one of the yep. places where the most of these are, have been done. Um, but it has an incredible success rate. It's kind of gross. Uh, yeah, what was it like back in the day and how is it done today? I assume today it's done through capsules. Well, I think people are still using the methodology of actually going up through the colon, but 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 people have tried to create capsules and, and consume these capsules with a drink, and then it gets there, and and those seem to be effective. They're they're not as effective as when you just the enema the the enema uh, yep. <laughs> um, the enema version. Um, and it's and because probably in the in the process of kind of getting that um, stool into a freeze dried format or into a pill format, you're losing probably some of the diversity that you just get when you do it the the old fashioned way. And there are risks associated with this or not? Are they overblown? I mean, there's certainly been. I know there was some hoopla about this at the FDA at one point. What what was that about? Well, I think the biggest risk is, you know, fundamentally, you're, uh, it doesn't feel like a therapeutic to give people shit. <laughs> so I think there's sort of this instinct that, okay, this isn't safe. But but there's, there is a reality around it, which is that you don't know what... Well, the, the source of that person is is really important, right? How do you know that that's a healthy, so-called healthy stool donor? And so what if they've got some weird pathogen that now you put it into this person uh, who's already in a depleted state? Who's already state, compromised, right? yeah. Um, and then furthermore, because everybody's microbiomes does do have these different functions, it's possible that you might cure them of the C. diff, okay, great, and you might not have given them a new pathogen, that's fine, but you might have changed their metabolism of foods in a way that's not beneficial to them. And so, for example, there are 
are some of these uh, case studies of someone getting a fecal microbiome transplant, and now all of a sudden they have obesity issues that they never had before. And so all of those things sort of what really is at the heart of it is that we're very early in understanding microbiome science. And so I think the FDA, you know, their job is to make sure that people are safe. And so they have to decide, is it more safe to kind of give people this cure that has this incredibly high success rate when fatality is on the other side? Or is it more safe to say, hey, let's keep learning more about this before we actually introduce it into clinical care? And they actually tried to shut the whole thing down. They essentially said FMTs are not approved by the FDA. They're not safe until we learn more about the science. What and year was that ish? This was probably, um, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. Okay. Oh, that, okay. That. Yeah. How long ago? Um, but essentially these people who had uh, these physicians, these patients, patients' families who had all experienced this benefit, and then people who were in the queue to get it done, essentially, you know, with pitchforks in hand, went to DC and said, this is crazy. Like this thing has such a high cure rate. How could you possibly take it away as an option for people? And so they put their tail reversed between their, their legs position. and <laughs> reversed it and let people, you know, you do them. Let's, let's talk about an example you just gave there, which I know is sort of theoretical, but I'm sure there are many cases like it where you take a... You take a lean individual who's hospitalized for some reason, they're given an antibiotic in the process, they develop C. diff colitis, uh, they get a fecal transplant and they recover. The fecal transplant came from somebody who was obese and now they develop obesity. So the hypothesis here has to be pretty clear that the uh, gut bacteria of the obese individual is playing a causal role in their obesity. So I want to tackle that topic, but first, why wouldn't the habits of the recipient immediately override the bacteria that they got on the receiving end, given that their habits are more in line with being lean? In other words, given the rapid evolution of these bacteria, why do they persist in their phenotype? Well, first of all, these are case studies, so they're they're these are not clinical trials, and so I think uh, you're dealing with the uncontrollable nature of of humans. But I would say one of the interesting things is that these people's habits did not go back to what they used to have. And one of the things we're learning about the microbiome is uh, through this gut-brain connection, your microbiome can actually influence your food cravings. And, and we actually have some data supporting that as well. And so if you think about this new microbiome as kind of maybe having a leaning towards a, a you know, it, it's not metabolizing food as efficiently. It's, it, 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 you know, kind of gives you a predilection towards obesity. But on top of that, it changes your food cravings, you've actually now got a double whammy against you that keeps you from being sort of your old self. And so I think the microbiome, you know, this gut brain connection, its ability to generate neurotransmitters, its ability to change cravings is still at a, you know, early stages of understanding, but it can basically change your behavior. So you're not really the old person you are. 